This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. My guest has written a book about his life. It's a great tale that goes from theater box offices to the castle stage on Riverside Drive, from the razzle-dazzle of Broadway to the clanging of prison doors. But mostly it's about a caring human being who saw something wrong and did something about it. The book is titled Fortune in My Eyes, a memoir of Broadway glamour, social justice, and political passion and the author is David Rothenberg. He's my guest today. Welcome. Thank you, Ronnie. Isn't there a similarity between the theater and our criminal justice system? Well, they're both dramatic. Right. That, that's what's similar. Really about. dramatic, right? Yes. Actually, when I left, when, when the Fortune Society started, and it was avocational for me, I found it more dramatic than most of the plays I was working on. Yeah. So maybe I have, was attracted to the drama of it. I, you and I cover the same eras essentially. Same century. Century. That's better <laughs> than that. But I'm older than you, so I'll make that disclosure. Uh, how did, you grew up in, in New Jersey. Yeah. In a middle class Jewish family? Yes. Socially conscious? Not particularly. Not, not unconscious, but not active. Yeah. I think my family had good values. I always remember that there was somebody visiting once and somebody used the N-word and my mother slammed the fork down and said, not in this house. That's not acceptable. So I, there, there was a, a social awareness, but they would, you know, we were post-depression, actually started in the depression, and, and most of the time was trying to get by for the family. Mm -hmm. So they were not active in in social causes or political causes, but but what I heard was of, of you know, FDR. They, yeah. That's where, that was our, that was our, that was, it. Our, that was our frame of reference. Absolutely. My family was that way too, although they joined things and they were, you know, pretty active. But I'm always interested in how people, why some people have this energy and passion and why other people don't. You know, I always... Have you ever thought of that? Always. And yeah. I've always thought that Jackie Robinson was my first political hero. I, w I was a big sports fan as a kid, but I didn't like the Dodgers. I was a giant fan. But when Jackie came on the scene in 47, I was 13. And uh, I had this passion that he make it. And I was very aware of all the hardships that he had, the, yeah. having to stay at separate hotels, being banned, and, and, and cats be and black cats. And heckled oh, and terrible. Terrible things. And I heard it when I'd go to the ballpark. And because of Jackie, I start, as a teenager, I started reading about FEPC and lynching laws. That's interesting. And when I went to college, I was very, the, the civil rights movement was what I was interested in politically as a kid. It wasn't as it wasn't as organized as it was later no, in the, no. later in your life. But I met Jackie years later I when he think. when he was uh, doing a radio program like you're doing this yeah. television program, and I used to bring theater yeah. guests all the time, and so I could hang out with yeah, him. That's so great. And he used to say to me, "How come we're getting all these great theater people from you?" And I said, "Because you're Jackie Robinson." <laughs> it's so that's so, it's the people who don't have that self awareness that are charming. Yes. And terrific. So you went to college and you got all this stuff, and then you came to Broadway, which was really your other. Basically, well, the th I, I wanted to work in the theater, but I didn't know what I wanted to do in it. And I answered every ad in the New York Times that said show business. There were lots of ads in the Times <laughs> in those days. <laughs> there, there were classified pages. Right. Yes. If, if you're under 20, you don't know what a classified ad is. Exactly. And not only that, they were separated, uh, female and male. Yes. <laughs> yes. That yes. was always there. <laughs> uh, but I answered an ad in the Times, and, and uh, the man was looking for a stringer to work on summer theaters. And I thought I was in, and it was a job for eight weeks. I was just out of the army, and I took it. And um, I remember somebody, I think it was my Aunt Hilda, said, make yourself, in, if you've got a job that you want, make yourself indispensable. Know, where, know who everyone is calling, know everything that's happening, and then they'll need you. Yeah. And at the end of the eight weeks, they couldn't fire me because I knew where everything was. Isn't that amazing? Be. Yeah. So then what happened? Does that still work? I have, I think it could. I think it does. Um, Although I think the framework is so different. You, you know, have to I, know everyone's email address. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 
it's a whole different world. You have to know it where is. to find something well, on and, the internet. In that world at that time, it worked for me. And I guess a bright young kid these days would find what works in that world. Yeah, I think it's similar. But then you stayed, and you really, you did, uh, and you even went, I mean, you, I remember, you know, everybody talks about the fact that you were Liz Taylor's, Elizabeth Taylor's date. escort. I, <laughs> date. I, 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 it was a date. She, she <laughs> said to me, will you, of course, we met early, we met at the, at the, uh, before we went into rehearsal, I went into Toronto. That, you know, that was a, the big, big scandal back in the early 60s. Richard and Elizabeth were both married to other people. They were doing Cleopatra in Rome. And at that point, Alex said to me, we're doing Hamlet. Alex Cohn, the producer, said, we're doing Hamlet with Richard Burton. You're going to handle the press. And that was like Angelina and Brad, only with talent. Let me just ask you one more question. Uh, were most of the stars that you met as interesting and as interested in other things, or were most of them kind of interested in themselves? Well, theater people, are th there's a lot of this, but there were people who were very, Julie Harris was a joy to work with and was very interested in who she was with. Uh, I loved working with Peggy Lee, uh, Dorothy Loudon. I think Peggy Lee is the one, somebody asked her what the era was, the Big Bang era, and she said, if, I'd know, if I had known I would live through an era, I would have paid more attention. <laughs> I that loved working great. with Peggy. Yeah. But you know, the, the, the uh, Hamlet experience, while it was, it was uh, theatrically the most exciting thing that could, in the 60s, everybody wanted to be a part of it, everyone wanted to get a glimpse of it. And I was spending most of my time with ca crowd control yeah. and paparazzi and screaming. And while it, it appeared glamorous, it wasn't the kind of theater that I wanted. And I told Alex Cohn, who I was working for, when that show ended, I wanted to leave. And I really got on a freighter and went to Rome. Oh, and and gave myself a few months, and I said, if when I come back, if I want to work in the theater, I want to do the kinds of things that matter. I, I was yeah. politically and it's socially conscious, but I but I wanted to work in the theater. And the first thing, I opened an office, and I produced in '66, produced the first anti-war play, Viet Rock, and that and then I read the script for Fortune in Men's Eyes, which was a play written by a man who had been in prison. Uh, based on his own, well, I, when I read it, I mm -hmm. knew it had to be autobiographical. Mm -hmm. It's about a kid getting raped mm -hmm. on his first night in prison. And when I met John Herbert, it, it indeed was his story. And it just rocked me. You know, we had seen prison movies. They were escaping or, or uh, rioting. James Cagney, that's uh, what I yeah, remember. I remember Burt Lancaster throwing Hume Cronin off in <laughs> brute force. But this was a play that was very different. It was about, and when I read it, I thought it was about how the system destroys a kid who's ostensibly innocent may have committed a crime. And, and when I met John, that was his story. As a 16-year-old, he went to jail for six months. And I met him when he was 38. And he said he always was on the fringe of the outcasts of society because of that six-month experience, his, his anger and also the record. And um, it, 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 it opened my eyes a little bit. But I wanted to get the play on. When the play was uh, in rehearsal, the actors wanted to go to a jail, see what it was like, so they could validate their experience. And that was my first visit to Rikers Island back in 66, um, the winter of 66. And when I went to Rikers, it was traumatic because I, I remember saying to a reporter who asked what it was like for theater people, and I said, this is an exercise in futility. If these kids that I see being herded around are there because they've broken the law or done something, how are they going to be any better as a result of this experience? And I've never changed my mind. I've been in prisons all over the country, all over the world, jails, prisons, uh, county places, mm -hmm. uh, the southern farm uh, uh, right. monstrosities. Or the chain gang. The chain gang, of. all of those. None of, it doesn't work. It's a conceptual misfiring. It's one of the stupidest ways of designing public policy. We worry about kids growing up I mean, we know the kids grow up, and this is where they land, and they spend. It's they're not human beings when they're in prison. No, they're not. And the whole idea of of why you put somebody in prison to, I mean, few people you want to really keep out of society, but most people you have the hopes of them learning something and teaching and developing to get out, and they don't. So we spend all the money on the prison industrial complex, and we don't send kids to preschool and, you know, you know early childhood education. And what do we Ronnie, in New York City, we know that, that, that uh, about 75% of the kids in New York that end up in prison come from six communities. If the right. money was put into those communities uh, exactly. for, for yeah. youth centers, for education, we, we would save so much money. But when, 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 uh, when I did the play, 
It was after one, a teacher came and said he was bringing 20 that's students. That's a very dramatic could we part have, of your book. Yeah, could we have a, uh, a discussion with the audience? And I thought, well, this is right up my alley. The myself and a couple of the actors came out on stage and invited the whole audience to stay. Do you want me to tell the story that's yes, in the book? Yes, this is a great story. And, and uh, all of the audience members were complimentary. The play was tough. It was a good play, and, and it had a good run. And... Uh, some, they were all saying nice things, and some guy in the audience said, oh, this plays a lot of junk, I don't buy it. And from the back of the house, a man stands up and said, well, if my 20 years counts for anything, you people couldn't watch what happens to us. And we were stunned. This was a real ex-con, right? So the, we invited the man down, his name was Pat McGarry, and for an hour, he really mesmerized the audience. He had been in a Florida chain gang, he had been in Clinton, he had been on Rikers Island, he had been in San Quentin, he had made the rounds. And he told, and I said, Pat, you've got to come back next week and do this because uh, people, this is 60, uh, this was by then uh, the spring of 67. I said, the public doesn't know about these sort of things. I don't know about it. And he said, well, I did white time. You've got to get a black guy because there's black time. And I said, you mean even in New York? It's, he said, it's totally segregated. And I said, well, I don't know anybody. He said, I know some guy. And he came back the following week with a man named Clarence Cooper who had done time in Milan, Michigan. And whereas Pat was outrageous and flamboyant and gregarious, uh, Clarence was intense and angry and dramatic. And they were, it was central casting because the two were so brilliant. Mm. And uh, we started this weekly dialogue. And the Times did a story on it. And then we found out that the, these weekly seminars that half the audience were people who had done time. And what I learned was that most of the guys who were coming to the play who had been able to stay out were in AA, and that they had a place to go to mm -hmm. that dealt with yeah. their, whatever it was, the, the demons, the inner demons that led, led them into antisocial behavior. Mm -hmm. But they had not dealt with their anger about the prison experience. And so I, mean, I said one night with a bunch of these guys and we were hanging around, what are we gonna do about this? And I said, let's educate the public. We can form an organization, and our goal would be to educate the public. And that's, and we took the name, Fortune Society from the play, and it was me and a handful of ex-inmates, ex and my th little theater office on 46th Street became the hangout. I was still doing shows. I didn't think that my life Which was gonna go in that area, but because I was a good publicist, I arranged for yes. some radio and television shows, and the big one was the old David Susskind show, which played on Sunday nights, and they had never been able to get formerly incarcerated people to go on TV because your life and career would you know, any job, Everybody. you would you would be blackballed forever. And most of the guys were lying uh, about their past because they, they wanted jobs and they wanted families and all, of, all everything that everybody else wanted. And after the Susskind program played, they ran, ran my name and address at the bottom, said contact these men, uh, new organization. I thought we'd get hundreds of speaking engagements. What happened the next day when I went to my office, the stairwell, the six floors was filled with men who had been out of gotten out of prison who were looking for help. The same thing that Fortune Amazing. faces today, 45 years later, looking for a job, looking for the homelessness. 50% of people coming out have nowhere to land. Uh, it just, I want something else. I got a call, I got a call yesterday from a kid who said he would he'd run into one of our guys and, and he said, the guy said to him, you, nobody's gonna judge you if you go to Fortune Society. He said, well, what do they want? And he said, his friend said to him, they just want you to be better than you are, to be the best that you can. And, so, yeah. and he said, so he, he get, this guy gave him my home number, and this guy kid called me, he's 25, and he said, I just want to be better than I've been. What do I do? And so I'm going to meet him, and he's going to meet, come to Fortune. So. I, you know, I worked a lot at Bedford Hills and with the women. I know. And um, I, re I remember, first of all, I was newly married and I had all these stepchildren and the phone bill would come and it was enormous. And I could think, what is all this phone bill from? It was all people calling me from Bedford, so we took care of that. But then this one young woman came in the winter. She had been released. She had a bag with her clothes in it. She was given $40. She was wearing open-toed shoes in the snow. $40 and a bologna sandwich. It was unbelievable to and me. It's absurd. And it's just... And no IDs. And, the, and to get started out here, yeah, they don't use that time inside to when somebody's coming out, get all the paperwork done so right. when they come out that they can right. have an ID. And instead, they come out homeless, as you said. And also, 
especially with the women, I think, or the younger people, they go back to the neighborhoods, which well, that's all caused they all the problems where they to are. begin with. So, so it's a, such a dehumanizing thing, but why do you think we haven't been able to humanize our approach to criminal well, the, justice? Well, the prison industrial complex has become there's such a big investment. Yeah. And if you watch television tonight, you just surface, there are more crime shows. Mm -hmm. uh, there's more crime committed on television any night of the week than there is on the streets of New York. Uh, crime sells. And, and it's I, I, bad from the minute they make an arrest, yes. right? And, the, and, yeah. and uh, years ago, somebody came to me and they, they actually wanted to do a television s series based on a theater guy working with formerly incarcerated people. It went as far as NBC giving Fortune some seed money and uh, had a mm -hmm. pilot script. A, a very good playwright named Peter Parnell wrote the script and then they, I got a call saying, it's not, nobody will sponsor a show like this. It's about the struggle that people have coming out of prison trying to make it. They much, it's much easier to get sponsors for a show about people committing yeah. crimes. Right. That's what they want. The guns come out and they're shooting. At Fortune, that's not what's happening. And you know, the most exciting thing is after I retired was Joanne Page, who succeeded me, knew, we always knew housing was the great issue. Creating the castle, yeah. the residence. Talk about up the in, castle. It, it is, it, it's 62 people. It's cheaper to keep someone in the castle than it is a shelter in New York. And yet pe you watch people come to the fact that there's something else. As, as one of the guys said, I always knew there was something else. I just didn't know where to find it. And, it, and it's very hopeful because we've created an environment that says, it, we don't care what you've done in the past. What do you want to do now? And, and the only, the only uh, criterion at the castle is no violence or the threat of violence. That's, that's it. If somebody relapses, and, and you know, you get people who've had 25 years of drugs, uh, if you relapse, we'll find you a, uh, a rehab for 30, 60 days, and if you're ready to try it again, come back. But it's... Uh, that's, o that's always the, a sticking point because you expect so much, and you have to understand that when there's a relapse, it's not a rejection, it's just... It, it's right? very tough, it's you really know, bad. if somebody's done 30 or 40 yeah. years, and when you hear the stories of childhoods that have been... They've all been abused, haven't they? Must have abused, being raised by the state, um, people who don't know their, who their fathers are. I go to this castle every Thursday night. It's the this residents sit with the executive team, and I'm, I'm a, an enthused observer because I watch people coming to terms. And one night... Uh, a few weeks ago, a guy said, I'm going to need some help. I haven't seen my father in 15 years. We had no relationship, but I want to try. I may need some support after the fact. And then around the room, everybody started talking about what they've gone through with their parents. And one guy threw his hands down and he said, I wish I had that problem. I walked down the street and I wondered, could that man be my father? And he started to cry. This is a big guy, done a lot of time, a lot of, you know, it's a real streetwise guy. And he never... And he started to run out of the room. And we grabbed him and said, you gotta stay. This is why you have to stay. You have to get that out. And he poured out these feelings about mm -hmm. never knowing who his father mm -hmm. was and, and his mother never wanted him. And uh, that's, that's who ends up in the youth houses and the foster homes and eventually in the prisons. And most of them to survive resort to the drugs or the alcohol because that's the, that's the way they can deal with reality. And, prison system never deals with that. They, they create an environment that nurtures the, the very hostility that gets people in there. It's, do you, uh, have, has anybody ever done a study, I don't think they have, of how many of the people in prison have learning disabilities? Oh, they, they all have well, to have them it, almost, it, well, right? I, I would say 50% are or more. Uh, functionally literate, yeah, more. at least. Yeah, we did a, we did a, uh, you know, a poll, sent a questionnaire out to the inmates at um, Bedford Hills years ago how many about their experience with violence in the family. And it was something like 70 or 80 percent of the, of the women had been either sexually abused by a family member or by um, their partner. You know, you know what the th sad thing, before you get, get into that deeply, when they tell you that they were bad, they say, I was a bad kid, and they justify the parent hitting yeah. them. I mean, I, uh, right. Uh, well, they also said with the domestic violence that that's how they saw their mother and father. That was how their mother and father that's interacted. What, that's what they so thought. So that's all part you of it. You know, on Stop and Frisk, which is mm -hmm. uh, not unrelated, recently I was at uh, Baruch College and I asked the kids what they thought of uh, Stop and Frisk. And only 10 of the kids knew what I was talking about. And of course, they were all the black kids. And 
I said to this one young black man, explain what stop and frisk is. So he did, and I asked him what his experience was. And he was said he was stopped by a cop and thrown down, and they stood on his back. And um, they were looking for a black kid in a red shirt who was 6'4", and this kid was 5'7", and looked 12. And I said to him afterwards, that's terrible. Have you done anything about it? And he said, oh, it's, it's not terrible. Don't worry about it. It happens to all my friends. And I said, it is terrible. And it's terrible that it happens to all your friends. Stop and frisk should not be... Uh, with, with the young black kids should not be a, a badge of honor or a medal of, of, uh, of rite of passage. It's, it shouldn't happen indiscriminately like right. that. So do you think our viewers are saying, oh, these people, I mean, they're such weepy... Uh, <laughs> oh, I can't worry I mean, about I, what... I can't p worry yeah. about <laughs> what other people <laughs> say. I have to do... What, Listen, I've worked with, with enough people that have done time that have changed their lives that I know that what is possible. I know that if somebody fails and, then, and there's a post as a headline, that people think that's the, uh, that's that's the standard. Right. Uh, most of the people that come to Fortune haven't been in headlines. They've been self-destructive. Uh, they've hurt people in some cases. Um, they've done bad things. They've broken the law. Uh, but the, the inner demons, once, the, once they start confronting the, their self-image and, and dealing with themselves it all in an environment that's supportive. It all comes from a sense of humanity and a sense of community. I mean, we have to worry about other people, don't we? And you have we're to be able to relate. <laughs> well, uh, all the anyway. religious people, I I, religion shouldn't be something that's a once a week experience. It should be how you deal with people. And whatever happened to forgiveness and bringing people back into the community? Well, that's the major thing. That, you know, I'm, uh, the whole question of whether chief executives should use the pardon, the power of the pardon or clemency. You have long timers who have been in prison for so many years and that they've behaved. I mean, there's no reason to keep them in for 35. And if they're in 50, 60, 70 oh, years old, that, what is the reason? They can save money. That, and you, if you talk money, you can reach even the most yeah, right. conservative politicians. There are men that are over 50 years old who are, have come to terms with what they did. They're ready to step out. We could release... Uh, a couple of thousand right now in New York State, and it would make it wouldn't affect. The only problem would be is there is nothing for them to come back to, and we, the money that we're saving, we should places like the castle should be created, not run by correction, not run by parole, but by concern, not pri not private. Uh, it has to be nonprofit. Yeah. Do you have connections to different businesses and industries? Well, we have. A, a, have do you have your own business or no, industry? No. no. No, but a lot yeah. of, uh, we have a staff, a fortune has a staff of 150 and uh, about 60% of the people have done time. A lot of the, you know, when, when got, somebody comes to fortune, and I remember one, I was asking one kid about uh, the fashion of low, you know, yeah, the pants, pants dropping, and he said, I didn't come here for a fashion discussion. I said, <laughs> I said, I'm not making a judgment. I said, but what you have to do is realize when you come to a place like fortune or any place that you go, you're applying for a job in some way because People like to see what your attitude is, what your talents are, and they, if they don't have a job, they could recommend you. And I said, and that's what happens at Fortune Society. A lot of people that come there who are trying, who want something else, you can go to bat for them and send them for interviews or hire right. them right in the house. Right. It's incredible. So I don't want everybody to think the book is only about that, but it was the thing that astonished, you know, that just compelled me. There is something so compelling. And every time I go into a prison, I think there for but the grace of God oh. goes I, because yeah. it's sometimes so easy. It's an incredible kind of experience. But let's talk about other things in the book. Show business, more show Sh business. Show business. What? I don't know. <laughs> it's, you, well, you did another play. Let's talk about that. The castle. The, the castle. castle. Yeah. Well, uh, after I retired and the, and the Fortune Academy uh, began, the Fortune Academy, the residents call the castle. It's that. Great building old, yeah. on 140th Street had been a Catholic girls' school, and it looks like a castle, so the guys call it a castle. And at the Thursday night meetings, as I mentioned, they sit around and talk about how their lives are going and how the, pro, how the house is working. And I would get theater tickets because of my theater connection. This one friend of mine, uh, Hamza Hakim, who loved going to the theater, we would go, and I'll, if I just tell one story, we went to a, the second stage once, and he said, oh, this used to be a bank. And I said, how could you tell walking in? He said, I used to rob banks. <laughs> and we would have a lot of laughs, and uh, he wasn't robbing banks then. He was very determined to have something else. And, he, and I said to him, you know, your life and the lives of these other guys are better theater than the, the theater I'm seeing a lot of the times. And so we started talking about creating a, a, a play using... Um, events, those vagina monologues, mm -hmm. as, a, as we, we 
we steal positively now. Four stools and four people sharing their lives. And uh, Hamza was all for it and then died of a massive heart attack at the age of 43 after, yeah. which all broke my years, heart. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but his best friend at the castle was a guy named Casimiro Torres. And, and a few months later, he said uh, he had talked to Hamza about what we had talked about. And uh, so he and I started talking about doing a play. And we, we thought, who would be other people who had different experiences uh, and whose stories are dramatic, and three men and a woman. It's co-ed, by mm -hmm. the way, at the castle. Mm -hmm. uh, so the f Hurry up, because we're coming to the end. I'm sorry. We so got terrible. Well, we got four people, and we, yeah. and, and we worked on this play, and we thought we were going to do it for a couple of weekends, and a producer saw it, and well, Eric Krebs, and he moved it off Broadway. It ran for a year, and now you can't get, we have two companies, and you can't kill it with a stick. We're playing. Right. We go to prisons, colleges, community groups, and... And if people wanted to book it or something, they just go to the website and they can find out all, all the information. All the Fortune Society and all for me. What's the website? FortuneSociety.org. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, David, I'm sorry that we've come to the end. We need more, much more time, so we'll have to come back. Well, you'll have to come back. And we'll what was this, more. 10 minutes? No, it was 30 minutes. Was <laughs> Thank you, David Rothenberg. And read his book. You really, um, you'll learn so much and you'll be touched by it. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.